so glad that I didn't wear that same sweater today because that'd be real awkward. Good morning, church family. What's up? How y'all doing? Oh, you can do better. How y'all doing this morning? Amen. Good to see y'all. I'm Montel, Pastor Montel, and I am honored to be able to see y'all today, honored to be able to serve you here uh, at Victory. And uh, you could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here uh, with us today. And so we want to say thank you. want to say thank you to those members who are here in our main sanctuary. want to say a special shout out to all the people who are visiting here. want to say welcome home, if you didn't hear that yet. Uh, and no matter where you might be watching us from one of our overflow rooms, maybe you're viewing from the chapel right now. If you're in the chapel, what's up? We know you're there. Uh, if you're part of our online community, Victory Live, which is new and doing great things right now, we want to welcome you. Uh, maybe you're streaming this message at a later time. We have people right now viewing from all over the world. And so we're honored that we get a chance to serve you and we hope you feel at home today. <laughs> Amen. Hey, if you have a Bible with you or an electronic device, on silent. In just a few moments, we're going to be reading from Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And as you are locating that scripture, before we get into the message, um, we're currently in the home stretch of our 21 days of fasting and prayer. How y'all doing with that? Some of y'all look hungry. Some of y'all don't look hungry. I can see who's in and who's, who's not. This is day 16. The weekend, this entire weekend, day 15 and 16. I think this is day 16. And before we dive in, I just want to share with y'all just real quick uh, two huge things that I feel like God has been showing me during this fast. I'm going to lay that on you today. The first thing that God has been showing me is that sometimes we're asking God, will you show us more of you? But he has a funny way of showing us more of us. I don't know if you're experiencing that. That's what I'm going through right now. God is showing me more of me. And a lot of times when you see more of yourself, you don't necessarily like what you see. Second thing that God has showed me is that there is, uh, when you are fasting and praying, there is a line that's drawn in the sand between your flesh and your spirit. When you're fasting and praying, there's a line that's drawn in the sand between flesh and spirit, and somehow I just keep hopping back and forth over that line. And when I say that, I don't mean like, like cheating and going and eating, stuff like that. I, what I mean is like, okay, so part of me wants to encourage everybody who is locked and loaded in this fast to say, finish strong. I'm so proud of you. God bless you. But there's another part of me that's like for everybody that's not involved in the fast, I hope you choke on a french fry, right? <laughs> that's the line between flesh and spirit. My flesh wants you to ch choke just a little bit, but my spirit is saying, God bless them and they happy meal, Jesus. God bless them and they happy meal. In other words, it's not too late. We still got a week left, and uh, if you can, if you will, we know you're going to be doing, you know, all the games and stuff this today. You'll be eating your little nachos. Listen, after that is over, join in and lock and load arms with your brothers and sisters that are fasting and finish the week out strong so collectively we can, listen, it's only the Friday night. Friday night, that's it. It's over at Friday. Some of y'all completely missed that. You're too saved. It's okay. <laughs> Friday night is over. Come on board. Somebody say amen. 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 Will you bow your head so I can pray over us here online? Uh, let's just uh, go into, before the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, you've given us free will. You have given us the freedom of choice. It's my prayer today that your sons and your daughters today would choose to say, not my will, but your will be done. That we choose today to be moved, that we choose to be challenged, we choose to be transformed more into the image of your son, Jesus. God, your word says that the son of man did not come to be served, but he came to serve. May that be the reason why we came today, not to be served, but to serve. Holy Spirit, have your way. Touch the hearts of your people today. Have us step out of our comfort zones, God, our complacency, and allow the glory of God to work in us and through us so that we can make your church, we can make the church resemble your son. We want to do that starting right here, right now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 Our senior pastors, Dennis and Colleen Rouse, are busy being Mimi and Papa to their new grandbaby, Audrey Bella Carlson, <laughs> ABC. She is here in the world, and that is their princess warrior. 
She is doing great things right now, and I can tell you that the Rouse and Carlson family, their uh, son and daughter, Josiah and Lauren, they would greatly appreciate your continued prayers uh, as Audrey is doing her thing in the world now. We uh, ask God to bless them. Okay, right now, I believe we're in one of the most exciting times of our church's history. I've been almost 10 years, and it just feels like a brand new church right now. This is big. I mean, we've done 25th anniversaries. We've done things, but right now is a very, very great time. Our senior pastor just written a book called 10, and we are now in a series going through that teaching, talking about uh, 10, discussing 10 qualities. As a matter of fact, if you're using social media, hashtag 10 qualities. We're talking about 10 qualities that move us, move us. Well, where are we going? I'm glad that you asked that. We are currently collectively being moved. Moved meaning we are being transitioned, transported, transferred, transformed. We are being relocated. We are being journeyed. And we are being taken from A to B, from one place to another. We are being taken from a believer to a disciple. And don't get it twisted. That word moved is an action word. Uh, it requires you to do something. And so I'll just say this. If you are comfortable and uh, complacent where you are right now, this message is probably not going to sit well with you. And not only that, if you're comfortable right now, uh, I can honestly say even the vision of where our entire church is going right now might not align with your vision because we as a church are moving and we're going deeper into relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you're here at Victory, you know this. If you are new, I want to catch you up. You're just coming on board. I want you to tell you what it looks like. Two weeks ago, our pastor talked to us about what it looks like to be passionately committed to Jesus. That was week one. That was chapter one. And then last week, our senior pastor, Dennis Rouse, had an opportunity to introduce us to what it looks like to have an extraordinary love for people, extraordinary love for people. And I can tell you, I saw this firsthand. This was just a pretty cool story. Uh, about a couple of weeks ago, right at the end of December, we were having our uh, year-end Christmas staff party. Everybody dressed all nice. We're in uh, downtown Atlanta. And while we're there, uh, it was one of those cold nights. It was Friday. I want to say it was either 17 or 19 degrees that night. And when I stepped outside of the, the hotel later that night, I looked over and I saw our senior pastor leaned over a homeless man. Him and his wife, Pastor Colleen, was there, and he's leaned over this homeless guy. And I'm watching this happen. Uh, it's 19-degree weather. He's about to give this guy his jacket. Now, this guy, he's kind of bundled up, and, you know, there's these grates or whatever, and he's laying on these things trying to, I guess, get the heat from underneath the, the hotel coming up. And, he's, and I'm watching my pastor uh, minister to this guy, and I'm, I'm literally watching this happen, and I'm thinking last week he taught a message about how to love the least, how to love the lost, how to love cross-culturally, how to love your enemy. And I, I know this guy is at least two to three of those four people. And then I flash back to him talking about uh, how during his lifetime he ended up meeting a homeless man, taking him in, serving him, clothing him, feeding him, taking him to rehab, walking with him through rehab, and from that standpoint, helping the man get a job, and that sometime later at his wedding, when even Pastor C's father was not there, this homeless man or previous homeless man is now the guy that is walking her down the aisle to be married. And so here's the deal. I hear a story like that. And it's one thing to hear something, but I am now looking at my pastor and I am seeing with my own eyes I am witnessing him talk the talk and walk the walk. And you need to know that that's a good thing about the church where you are planted because you don't just have leadership that is saying one thing and doing another. You have leaders that are walking the walk and talking the talk. And I appreciate we get that here at Victory. And just sidebar, not all churches have that. If you came here from another church, you ought to say amen. Um, <laughs> listen, uh, so uh, that, that was those couple of weeks. And then this week, we're in week three. We're in chapter three of the book, and we are moving. Action words. Somebody say moving. moving. We are moving from believer to disciple. And today, we're going to be examining what it looks like to have the heart of a servant. What does it look like to have the heart of a servant? There's a scripture in Philippians chapter three, verse 13, says this. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. I haven't figured it out. But I focus on this one thing. Scripture saying, there's a lot of stuff I don't know, but there is this one thing that I do know. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race 
and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. It's the word of the Lord. Who do you pattern your life after? Who's your role model, your idol, your example? Who do you follow? You know, it's interesting is people who call ourselves Christians, do we actually pattern and look like Christ? Debatable. I would submit to you the way the church looks right now are people who are claiming to be the church are not necessarily looking very much like Jesus at all. It's interesting that at the end of that passage, Paul, the writer of that, who wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament, he is actually saying to us, he is saying, I want you to use my example. I want you to pattern yourself after what you see me do because I've only done what I've seen Jesus do. And Jesus does the same thing. He says, I want to be your example. I want you to pattern yourself after me because everything you see me do, I've only seen my Father, which is in heaven, do that. Paul was a servant. Jesus came to serve. They had hearts of a servant. Now, transparent moment here, that was not me. Back in the day, no servant heart. I mean, I loved Jesus. I believed in Jesus, but I wasn't trying to be like him. No servant heart. I recognize you, Jesus, as my Savior because I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. That was my stance. But I don't want to know you as the Lord because I'm trying to do me. I want to turn up now and turn down later, God. And here's what that starts to look like in my life. I'm just talking about me. This is probably not you. But what that looks like for me, it becomes, I believe in you, Jesus, but I want to be able to have sex outside of marriage. I mean, it's my body. It looks like, I believe in you, Jesus, but why should I have to tithe when I can do so many good things for charity with my money? It looks like I believe in you, Jesus, but I just want to live my life, my body, my money, my life. Is it really my life? I mean, is, is my life really my life? Is your life really your life? If you've ever heard me say anything before that stuck with you, this is something I hope you ingrain in your very spirit. And I need you to know this. Whether you are a Christian or not, you did not pay for you. You did not pay for you. You may not understand that. You may disagree with that. We just read in Philippians chapter 3, it says, if you disagree on some point, God will make it plain to you. I'm going to tell you where he makes it plain. He makes it plain right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. You do, it, you do not belong to yourself. For God has bought you with a high price. And if you're paying a high price for something, that must mean you're valuable. So you must honor God with your body. You do not belong to you. You got to honor God with our body. How do we honor God with our body? Well, we first must have the mind of Christ. And the way we get the mind of Christ is to seek after his heart. Because when we seek his heart, he can then give us our heart's desires. You ever hear, I want God to give me my heart's desires. Listen, God wants to give you your heart's desires, but really our hearts suck. And so that is why we have to seek God's heart. Because if we seek after God's heart, then he can give you your heart's desires because your heart desires what God's heart desires. But get this, this whole walk, this whole thought process of, of uh, becoming, a, having the heart of a servant, this is not an easy task that we're talking about. 
This is not easy because the world and the processes as humans that we go through, literally everything that we know and believe has to be completely turned sideways and flipped upside down to even understand this. This is a process. That is why we're moving and taking action toward that. And even if you're a great person, you have great skill set, you can do lots of wonderful things, uh, you have great character, X, Y, and Z, fill in the blank, you need to know there is one characteristic in particular that has to stand out above the rest in order to have the heart of a servant. And that is humility. Say that with me, humility. 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 If you're going to move from believers to disciples, Here is one thing that we're going to have to know. And if you're taking notes, the first point is that true greatness begins with a humble heart. True greatness begins with a humble heart. The Bible gives us a glimpse into a particular night where Jesus was hanging out with his disciples. It's captured in Luke chapter 22 as you read through that. Uh, The disciples, these are the guys who walked closest to Jesus, and these guys miss it. I mean, they completely blow it, all right? They walk close to Jesus. They're all having dinner together, you know, probably lamb chops and hummus and and, uh, the the flattened bread, all that stuff. And, And they're having this time together, fellowshipping with each other. And Jesus is bearing his soul to his closest brothers, the closest people that he has walked with, done miracles with for three years. He is spending time with them, and he breaks out in this session of everything, and he eventually says, hey, y'all, I'm about to die. And while he is saying this, they are busy trying to discuss who's riding shotgun. Do y'all know what that means? Who's riding shotgun? That means everybody's in the car together, You're not driving, but you want to sit in the passenger seat. That's what the disciples are doing in that moment. We want to know which one of us is going to be great. You're great, God, and we know that, but who is next in line? Who got next? That's what they're trying to figure out, and so they miss it. And we miss it, too, because we're trying to figure out, well, who got next? Or How do I be great? And then there's this crazy little scripture. It's really short, Matthew 23 and 11, and it says, the greatest among you, the greatest among you must be a servant. The greatest must be a servant. That just doesn't sound right. If you think about it as just humanly to be the greatest, how do you be a servant? How is it that you become great by being a servant? That's what Jesus was trying to get them to see. That's why he wanted to wash their feet. And they were like, no, you're not washing my feet. They did not understand. And we can do the same thing. It's that completely non-worldly thinking. It is complete kingdom culture thinking to say, if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled, but if you humble yourself, you will be exalted. But in order to understand this is kingdom culture, this is how to move from from believer to disciple, true greatness begins with a humble heart, but it doesn't stop there. Second point is a humble heart is formed by serving others. A humble heart is formed by serving others. Now here comes another disclaimer. Normally comes a time in the messages that I speak where I eventually offend somebody. So for the record, if you have not been offended in some way yet, this is a good place that that's probably going to happen. That's called a heads up. I want you to get this. You might hear what I say, but I need you to hear what Jesus is saying to you today. A servant can be faithful, timely, dependable, responsible. But when it's all said and done, a servant who isn't humble is just a volunteer. Mm, my sermon just went viral. Hold up, hold up. Why would you say that? I volunteer. I do volunteer. I give my time. I give my money. Why would you say just a volunteer? Like being just a volunteer is a bad thing. That's offensive to say that, Pastor. I give and I do a lot of different things to volunteer. Well, I want you to get the difference because there's a difference between being a servant and a volunteer. This is where you need to be able to draw the line between the flesh and the spirit and know the difference. I'll give you an example. Do you want a volunteer at a restaurant to take your order or do you want a server to take your order? Wives, do you want your husband to volunteer to meet your need? Or do you want your husband to desire to serve you to meet your need? Husbands, do you want your wife to volunteer to meet your need? Or do you want her to desire to serve you to meet your need? Those of you here today, 
You have children uh, up in the children's church right now. Do you want someone to volunteer to watch your kids or do you want someone to serve your kids? Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down here? Listen, humility is at the center of the heart of a servant. Don't get me wrong. Volunteering is a wonderful thing. We appreciate that. We love you volunteering, but you got to get this. It's the heart behind your volunteering that determines whether you're a believer or a disciple. Did you get that? Somebody missed that. It's the heart behind your volunteering that determines if you are a volunteer or a servant, a believer or a disciple. You got to get this. Volunteering, yeah, that's what you do. Humility deals with who you are. You see, you can be a volunteer and not be humble, but you cannot be humble and not be a servant. When you are serving, you have to have that capacity. And we should never allow what we do to determine who we are, define who we are. We should always allow who we are to define what we do. There's a lot of notes in there right there. Y'all might have to rewind that later and catch some of that because that's coming a little quick. Why am I so passionate about this? I can tell you why. Because that was me. That was me. I was, I was horrible. No servant heart. I was, I was horrible. And I was nice. <laughs> really. As I call that nice nasty. I was nice nasty. And nice nasty is some of the nastiest nice that out there. You might not, if you don't understand that or that might not be you, but uh, there are people out there who are like that, that have capabilities and they can do certain things, but there's a, that little thing of humility that's, that's missing there. And that was me. I was not humble. No servant's heart. I thought fame defined me. I thought success defined me. I thought financial wealth defined me. I thought uh, notoriety, all those things define who I was. And because of that, I was one to be served and not to serve. But I had to learn a lesson from that and uh, they say a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. A fool has to learn on his own. This is what I had to learn. I'm trying to help you be wise right here. I'll never stop saying this. There's a difference in you humbling yourself and God humbling you. God humbled me. Not pretty. Before I even got to victory, I served in a ministry for seven years, armor bearing. I had a lot that I learned during that season. And I can tell you right here and right now, one of the things I learned that it was a growing time. It was a tough time all at the same time. God had to step in and he had to discipline me because I was not willing to discipline myself. And the tough times that I was going through and I thought that apparently my world was breaking was actually for my making. That's not for me. That's for somebody else out there. Whatever that tough time is that you think is for your breaking is actually for your making. I had to get it. Difference between volunteering and serving. When I'm serving, I'm not just checking off a box. I'm not just filling out the to-do list. Serving is about me giving myself away, us giving ourselves away. And actually, that is our third point. That is, we give ourselves away, we will be fulfilled and secure. As we give ourselves away, we'll be fulfilled and secure. Once again, that's that, that kingdom thinking, that God, culture, Jesus culture type of thinking. I mean, everybody in the world knows if as a human, you know that does not make sense. I mean, think about it. If, if I have a bag, what in the world is in that bag? What you got in that bag? Shout out to Ludacris. Sorry, my mind thinks like that. If you have a bag and that bag is full, if I were to start giving things out of that bag, you would naturally, in the natural, watch that bag start to decrease. At the same breath, if I have a bag and it's empty and I start receiving things, that bag is now becoming full right? Humanly, that's what makes sense, that when you receive, you get full. But somehow, these scriptures are telling us, this servant's heart is telling us that it is by giving that somehow you're going to be fulfilled, fulfilled, meaning filled full. Well, what does that mean? How is it possible? It simply means this. That means it's determined by if you want to be filled by the world or you want to be filled full by the word. Some of y'all missed that. I'll give it to you a different way. Um, the world tells you, I am somebody. The world, the word tells you that in order to become somebody, you have to become nobody. Okay. Somebody say, we're moving. we're moving. Come on, say, we're moving. we're moving. The world has an identity crisis. It says, you have to seek deep within yourself to find out your true self and who you really are. The word says, you got to lose yourself to find yourself. Somebody say, we're moving. 
The world instructs us to be strong. The word instructs us that in my weakness, he is made strong. Somebody say we're moving. The world says, keep rising to the top. Make that successful. Shout out to Dougie Fresh. Keep rising to the top. Uh, the word says that you must decrease in order for God to increase. Somebody say we're moving. The world says, YOLO, you only live once. But see, the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. If you only live once, why are there things that can't be seen? For the things we now see will soon be gone. But if you only live once, how can something that we have now be gone? But the things we cannot see will last forever. But if you only live once, why is there something that we cannot see that will last forever? So I answer that by saying, perhaps you do only live once here. This is how we move from believer to disciple and we become greater. We want to be great. We become greater as our hearts are humbled and then our hearts become humbled by serving others. And then we are filled full, fulfilled as we secure this place in God by humbling our hearts and giving that humble heart away. Do you have a humble heart? Like really, self-reflection, do you have a humble heart? Humility is at the center of the heart of a servant. Well, pastor, now that I know what a servant's heart is and what it looks like, how I get me one? <laughs> Here is how you develop a servant's heart. First of all, Serve people in your family. Serve people in your family. Easier said than done. First Timothy says this, chapter 3 and verse 5. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Mm, mm, mm. I want to give you a glimpse into the Jordan household, just share with you how I try to serve my family. I have a daughter, Samantha. She is, as she says, five and a half. And my five and a half year old, one of my jobs is that every night I tuck her to bed. I tuck her in the bed. And it normally takes about 30 minutes. <laughs> I mean, we got to tell stories about princesses and princes and unicorns. And we pray and we sing songs. Like it takes 30 minutes. But I love it because I'm investing in my daughter and I want her to know that as a father, I want her to know what it looks like to have a father serving her. I have a son who's 14, Skylar. He's currently 14 years old, feet bigger than mine. And I will change my work schedule around to make sure I'm at his basketball and football games because I want him to look up into the stand and see his daddy is there. And I have great relationship with my son, Skylar. Uh, to the point of where I still get to tuck him into bed. He's, a, he's almost a grown man, and I still get to tuck him into bed because we have a relationship like that. And let me just say this. If you are parenting and you have a teenager that does not hate you, <laughs> congratulations. I'm blessed. I was waiting for that day to come. Did not come. We have great conversations. We talk sports. We talk all types of different things. We pray over people, have great conversation because I invest in him. I want him to know what it looks like to have a father serving him. Comes to my wife, Kristen. She's at Hamilton Mill this morning serving. My wife, Kristen, and I, we have regularly scheduled date nights. We put it on a calendar. We have regularly scheduled intimacy. We put it on the calendar. If you work in business, you know that whatever's on the calendar is going to get done. <laughs> Some of y'all missed that. If it's on the calendar, it's going to get done. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you something. I want my wife, I want my wife to know that I am committed and dedicated to serving her. All my family, I need them to know that I am committed and dedicated to serving them. And you got to get this. I don't want nobody in my house out serving me. I'm not talking to me. I don't want anyone to outserve me 
Because that's the position God placed me in, in the covering over my home. Even if they don't serve me back, if they don't respond, it doesn't matter. That's not the position. God placed me in the position of authority to serve them, not dependent on their response, but based on what he told me to do. And that's what I will do. I serve them. How are you serving the people in your family? How are you serving in your home? How are you serving in your marriage? It's a scripture, or it's not a scripture, a uh, pastor uh, gives this quote in the, in the book 10. He says, marriage reveals volumes about what's really in our hearts. Take a moment, just talk to the men for a sec. I get to do Aaron, uh, ministry with Aaron Bourne here at Victory Men United. Got some wonderful things coming up. And when we get a chance to, to speak and talk, men, you have heard me say this before. We are supposed to be the leaders, the spiritual covering over our homes, over our wives, over our children, over our resources. That's where he placed us. But sometimes we forfeit our role for things of the world rather than things of the word. That's why we find ourselves sometimes in a place of, well, I wear the pants in the family. This is my house. I'm the man of the house. You're going to do what I say? I'm the man of the house. If you have to say, you're the man of the house, you're not the man of the house. But I can tell you who's the head of the house. The head of the house is the one who's out serving everybody else. Uh, if you can't say amen, say ouch. Listen, I'm not married to you and I'm grown. I can say that. Listen, men, we are moving from believer to disciple. Moving from believer to to disciple. You are what you believe. You are now being disciplined. You are being discipled to look more like Jesus Christ. Got a marriage conference coming up in just a few weeks. Super excited about that. February 9th and 10th. I uh, want you to know if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, you're playing yourself because we are doing it big. I guarantee it's going to be an awesome, awesome Time. I know we have a lot of singles who are registered. You are coming, and I got to tell you, we are going to pour into y'all. It's going to be a fantastic time. Myself, Kristen, Pastor C, Pastor D, uh, um, uh, Lecrae, and Dara Moore, all these things are going to be there to pour into you. If you have a good marriage and you are registered for this conference, we've been praying for you, and we want you to know we are going to celebrate marriage with you. We got a party planned on Friday night, and I'm telling you, we are going to be lit up. We are going up in the lobby. We got uh, uh, chocolate fountains and live band. Like, we are going in to celebrate marriage. And at the same breath that we're celebrating with our singles, we're celebrating with people who have good marriages, we also understand that some of you in here are hemorrhaging. Some of you in here are bleeding out in your marriage. We understand that. And we're going to be addressing those things on Saturday. We're going to dive deep and give you the tools that you need to stop the bleeding and get to a place of healing, a place of wholeness. But here's what I want you to know. Going into that, and this is just super important, super important um, Kristen and Montel cannot save your marriage. Can't do it. I can't save your marriage. Now, I can point you and tell you what Jesus did to save our marriage so that you can know God can do the exact same thing for you to save your marriage if you will allow him. Now, here's why I say that, because a lot of times in ministry, we have people that will reach out and say, I need to talk to Pastor Montel. I need to talk to Kristen. I need to, only they will understand. Uh, only they will understand what I'm going through. Well, we have a pastor here who can talk. No, I don't want to talk. We have some biblical guidance here who can, no, I don't want to talk. We have this counseling that, no, I don't want to talk. We have this session. We have these resources. We have this book. We have this meeting. We have this group. No, no, only they can, only they, no, no, not only they can. All they can do is point you to Jesus. I can tell you what Jesus did for me, and then I can point you into knowing what Jesus can do for you in your marriage. You know, let me put it like this. What I'm about to say next is either prophetic or pathetic. I don't know which, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you and your spouse together could agree to outserve each other for the next three weeks, God would begin to transform your marriage before you even got to the conference. I wish somebody would take me up on that challenge and see if I'm lying. Listen, Kristen and I, we have never, ever, 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 ever seen a marriage fail where a husband and a wife were trying to outserve each other. We have to be able to serve the people in our family. That's number one. Next, how else, pastor, can I develop a servant's heart? Well, the second way is to serve people in your community. 
Serve people in your community. Who are the people in your community? Well, it might be your neighbors. Do you know your neighbors? Do they know you? Do they know you're a Christian? I'm not talking about like you trying to convert them and evangelize. I'm saying, do they, can they visibly see Christ in you? Do you smile? Do you wave? Do you make eye contact when you're coming and going out of your neighborhood? Is your home well kept? Is your yard manicured? How do you look when you dress? How are you taking? Uh, can people see that you walk in Christ without you saying anything? That's how we start to serve in our neighborhoods without even speaking to people to begin with. Uh, what, who else is in your community? People on your job. How do you serve people on your job? Well, do you work as unto the Lord? Show up right when it's time to punch the clock? Do you get there early? Are you ready to go and leave a couple minutes before it's over, or do you stay late? Do you kind of slack off during break times and lunch time? Do you uh, ever buy a beverage for somebody that's in your office? Have conversation. Do you ever invite somebody to lunch? Have you ever asked if you can pray for somebody on your job? I'm not talking about evangelizing. I'm not talking about trying to convert. Just ask somebody, hey, how can I pray for you? I don't know if you know this. But people who aren't even Christians, they don't normally turn down prayer. No, 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 thanks. I'm, I'm good. They, they don't know. Well, hey, if that works, then hey, I'll take a shot at that too. Yeah, pray for this. Pray for that. Pray for them. It's another way to serve people in your community. What about the people at your school, your peers, your classmates, your teachers, all those different people, your circle of influence there? Are you just trying to fit in or are you trying to stand out like God has called you to? There's a scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. says, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Who does that? Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Scripture doesn't say do stuff for people to praise your heavenly father. It says all you do is do good deeds so the light shines and then everyone will praise your heavenly father by you doing the good stuff that you're supposed to do. Your community, your friends, your, your circle of influence, how, you, how, how are you serving them? When y'all get together, do you become more like them or do they become more like you? Here's a sobering thought. Here in this building, watching online, the chapel, wherever you are, sobering thought. For some people, you will be the only representation of Jesus that they ever see. That should excite some of you, and that should terrify some of y'all. Well, how else, Pastor? How else can we develop a servant's heart? The third way we develop a servant's heart is to serve in your church. Serve in your church. If you've been here at Victory, you probably know this story. If you have not, I'd love to share this with you. Uh, my wife, Kristen, and I, our testimony is that we began attending Victory here in 2008. We've been here almost 10 years. I was still an R&B recording artist. My wife was uh, managing my career and the careers of other artists. We started out here at, at Victory as visitors. Uh, we quickly became renters. Here's what I mean. If you read chapter 3, or you're going to be reading chapter 3, pastor talks about the difference between visitors, renters, and owners. We got here as visitors. We quickly became renters, and uh, we knew that this was our home. Somehow we got here, and we knew, hey, this feels like home, and then we immediately became members. I mean, we went through membership class. We were tithers. We were locked and loaded, and early on in our journey here to victory, uh, we heard a message just like this one, Pastor Dennis preached it in this very room uh, right here, and it was a message on serving, and we knew that during that message that we wanted to serve. And that might be you today. You might be here. You may not even be a member yet, but you know there's an unction. There's something inside that is saying, hey, I know that this is for me. God highlighting things for you. This is for me. You know that there is something in you that says, I have a desire to serve. That's when we became owners that's when you start to become an owner of ministry. Children's ministry, that was where the need was at the time. Major, major need. And listen, we're gifted in other areas. We're gifted in finance. We're gifted in music. We can do other things. But the plea that came from the platform was, hey, we need help in our children's ministry. And so Chris and I, we humbled ourselves because we wanted to see that ministry flourish. 
And we determined we were going to go to the nursery and the preschool ministry and serve the babies because we felt like that was what the Lord wanted us to do. That's what he wanted us not to volunteer, but to serve. And I can tell you of my 10 years being here at Victory, that decision was one of the best decisions that I ever made in my life. I served in children's ministry here for nearly a year. My wife served there for three years and even helped to be a part of the launching of children's ministry up at Victory Hamilton Mill. I say all that to say this. Today, we all have an opportunity to become one step closer from believer into becoming a disciple. Now, some of y'all here, you are already serving, and you're serving in multiple areas in ministry. And I want you to know we honor you, we appreciate you, and we are not asking you to do anything else. If you're here at Victory and you're not serving and you call this your church home or you believe this is your church home, I'm going to challenge you today. I'm going to ask you to do one of two things. In the seat back pocket in front of you, is one of these. I'm going to ask you to take it out and hold it in your hand. Like right now, just reach. You ain't got to do nothing with it. Just take it out, hold it in your hand. Or if you have your mobile device, take out your phone, hold it in your hand. Just, just want to ask you just to hold it for just a moment. You can do either. Have you ever heard the 80-20 rule? 80-20 rule is this. Corporations talk about this. Churches in America talk about this. That is 20% of the people do 80% of the work. A lot of churches, 20% of the people do 80% of the giving. That's a little different here at Victory. I want to say that those numbers are not, do not reflect here at Victory. Um, we have tithers here, and I want you to know and I'm super proud. We have very generous givers here at Victory. We are an extremely generous church. We get to impact the world. We can do stuff and influence the world when we're all giving and doing our part. I'm talking above the tithe. I'm talking offering, special gifts, things like that, heart of the house, those things that we get to do to pour into different places. That's what makes us and gives us the, the things that God wants to do in us, not just in our church, but in the world. But when it comes to serving, we got to step up our game. And what I'm talking to you right now is not milk. This is meat. We want to help you today move from believer to disciple. It's one step closer. Operative word there, move, taking action. Our entire church right now, our entire staff, we are prepared right now to serve you by getting you the opportunity to be plugged in to serve. Our entire staff, we're serving you today to get you plugged in to serve. And I want you to know the places that you can serve in ministry, they are limitless. Tons of places where you can serve. You can look on that card, and, and let me just tell you, the, the card that you're holding or the, the text that you're about to make, it can be the blessing that you've been waiting for in your life, thinking you're trying to bless the church and God is trying to bless you by giving you that servant's heart. Don't disqualify yourself. Don't count yourself out. Well, I can't do it because, of, listen, you ever drove here to, to church and parked your car? Great. You can show somebody where to park their car. Parking lot ministry. You ever came into church and sat in a seat like you're doing right now? Wonderful. You can show somebody else to their seat. Ushering. Ever made a cup of coffee? I mean, like a good cup of coffee? You can serve up in the cafe. You can serve in the bookstore. Lots of places where you can serve. Music ministry. You have a desire to do music, a desire to sing. Singing in the shower does not count. <laughs> Just saying. But if you have a gift, you have a desire to serve, not volunteer, but to serve. You have the eyesight, the vision to look beyond this platform and see there are multiple services, there are worship going on all throughout this church. You play a guitar, you play drums, you lead vocals, you lead, you worship. There are places for you to serve. If that's not on the list, write it in. Listen, y'all, we're in a place right now where God has gifted you all to serve somewhere. And I'll just mention this one more piece because this is where a current need is. 
children's ministry. Eighty twenty rule. Eighty percent of the people currently serving in children's ministry are women. Twenty percent are men. Do not we need to have men teaching these young boys and guiding and protecting our children? Once, twice a month? Specifically, Saturday night service, 6 p.m. We'd be packed up in here, 1,500 strong. It's full 500 kids out there that need someone. And here's the thing. I need you to get this. At 1 p.m. on Sundays, 1 p.m. on Sundays, we need people to be able to help serve our children. And I said serve our children, not ask to volunteer. you got to understand, we are blessed at this church. We don't have babysitters. At this church, you have people serving your kids right now. They are ministering to them, worshiping with them, laughing with them, reading scriptures with them, singing songs with them. That's what we need. We need the servant's heart to be there. And I want you to know, our kids need you. Our children need you. Are y'all listening? The babies need you. So I don't know what type of commitment you can make. I don't know what you're willing to make. Some of you got plenty of time. You can make a big commitment, but you can determine that. Some of you have no time, but you still know God is saying, but you can do something. Whatever that is, I'm going to ask you today to step out in faith, choose to say, not my will, but your will be done. And God, where do you want me to serve? And so we're going to take just a few moments. There'll be a song just kind of playing softly underneath. And here's what I want you to do. As you decide, I want to be greater. I want to serve others. I want to give myself away. Here's how you're able to do this. In the card you're holding, there's a list of things that you can say, I want to serve here. On the flip side, if you le legibly write your information there, you turn this into the ushers on your way out of the service, someone will immediately be reaching out to you. If you want to do it on your phone, go to the app, Victory ATL. At the very bottom of your app, there's something that says serve. You push that button serve, a screen pops up. It says what campus? You choose the campus where you want to serve. Push the campus, a list like this pops up. You determine where you want to serve, put your information in, submit. Someone from the church is reaching out to you. You don't have the app, you can go to serveatvictory.com, serveatvictory.com. You put it in, screen comes up, it says serve. You scroll down, where do I want to serve which campus? It shows which campus you want to serve on. A list just like this one comes up, and it says, hey, you choose where you want to serve, put in some information, submit, Boom, the church is reaching out to you. Everybody got that? I know you're being challenged, but like I said, we're not on milk no more at Victory. We're in meat. We got to grow. We are moving. And I'm challenging you that this is not going to bless the church more than it's going to bless you because God is going to handle that. So in this moment right now, use your phone, use the card. We're going to actually take time in the service for you to be able to determine what you will be willing to do to serve your church. ushers, our greeters. There's plenty of places to be able to serve. Parking lot ministry, translation. I give myself away. Membership class, you want to be a part of securing the church. Married life, we need healthy couples to come in and help us with couples. Facility services, the guardians that keep our, our facilities clean around there. Special events, hospitality. Where can you use your gift? Where can you use your gift? Volunteering, the bookstore, health and wellness, production, cameras, local outreach, prison ministry, pre-married life, Victory Vida, Forward, Women's Ministry. Give myself away 
I hope you will do it. You don't have to, but you get to. I never forget that. You get to. Before I leave here today, I would be remiss if I did not give you an opportunity to know who Jesus is. Because as we're talking about this moving from believer to disciple, believer to disciple, you might be here and not be a believer. I want to tell you, what that simply means is scripture talks about that if you would believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the son of God, that you would be saved. That's the starting point we're talking about. Throughout this message, we're talking about moving even beyond that. But in the beginning, just believing with your heart, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that is the beginning of salvation. And you might be here and you've never made that. Maybe you've never made that step before. I want to offer that to you today. And when I make you that offer, the beautiful thing is you can receive Jesus today or you can reject him today. Either way, you get to choose. And I never want us outside of this lifetime, after this lifetime, to be in a place where we see each other and I'm going to be with Jesus. You're not, for whatever reason, going to be with Jesus. And you look at me and say, why didn't you tell me? Not going to happen. I want to tell you today, I want to give you the option, the opportunity to say I receive him, or the opportunity to say, oh, not yet, or maybe later, or no. But I hope you would say yes to Jesus today. You may have received Jesus before, but now you are away from him. You feel like maybe sin or something has you distant from him. He wants to draw you back closer home today. As we said, welcome home at the beginning of the service. And so I'm going to ask this question, this very simple question. When you close your eyes tonight, if for whatever reason you did not wake up on this side of eternity, when you wake up, do you believe you're waking up to a God that is saying, well done, my son or my daughter? Or do you believe you will wake up to hear, I never knew you and that you would be apart from God? If you cannot answer that question, I'm talking to you today. That's everyone in this room. If you'll bow your head and close your eyes, those watching online, those in the chapel, overflow rooms, everyone bow your head and close your eyes. I've just said words, but I know God is speaking into the hearts of men and women today, boys and girls. If you're here today and you heard that plea and you know that you are apart from Jesus and you want to make that right today, if that is you, I'm going to ask you to be courageous. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand just so I can acknowledge you. If that's you, God bless you. Thank you for your courage. I see. Come on, lift it up. If that's you, God bless you. I just want to recognize you. I just want to acknowledge you all across this room. I see your hand. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, you can put your hands down good news is that anybody that ever came to Jesus, we had to realize that we were sinners and we needed a Savior. And this is where we are now. Whether we are receiving Jesus for the very first time or coming back to him, we can say this prayer. And it's not a finish line, but it is a starting point. And so I'm going to ask those returning, those receiving Jesus for the first time, and those who are walking in Christ right now, if we can repeat these words together. Just say, Jesus, I love you. You love me first. I believe you're the son of God. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I believe you're that savior. I believe you died on a cross for my sin. You went to the grave, but you rose again for my salvation. So I will have eternity with you. I repent from my sin and I bring you into my heart drive out all darkness, replace it with your light, and I will make you the Lord and the Savior of my life all my days. I'll serve you, not volunteer. I'll serve you with everything in me. Now, in Jesus' name, just lift your hands all over this building. If you're watching online, family rooms, wherever you are right now, just let God do surgery. Let him do surgery. God, we thank you. We honor you. We exalt you. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for giving us hearts to serve by making us greater by us being allowed the opportunity that we get to do this. We get to serve. And thank you for those that just came back home to you in Christ Jesus, we pray. And everybody said amen. 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 God bless you, church.